Welcome to Money and Me, where we look at the financial life stories of some of our leading citizens. This week, I'm talking to someone who is a polymath. He's a, a voiceover artist, he's a financial journalist, he's a best-selling author, he's expert on cryptocurrencies and precious metals, and perhaps best known of all for writing in Money Week magazine. His name is Dominic Frisby. Dominic, welcome to Money and Me. Thank you very much, Graham. Now, I, I know uh, in doing a little bit of research on your background that your, your father was the, the, the playwright and novelist Terence Frisbee, whose work included the, the long-running theatre play, There's a Girl in My Soup. Now, tell me a bit about what life was like growing up, and you know, the, the life of a writer can be a little bit financially precarious. So what was it like? Well, it, it can be, and uh, my dad still is Terence Frisbee. He's still with us, um, and he wrote... Uh, There's a Girl in My Soup, and I think he wrote it in maybe 1965, and it was put on in 1966, and I, was, I wasn't born until 1969, but it became the most, uh, it became the longest running comedy in the history of the West End. It broke all the records. Th those records have since been overtaken, but at the time, it ran for six years, and it made Michael Codron, who was the man who produced it, made his fortune. And... Um, it was just unbelievably successful. And dad went from being a sort of, um, you know, his dad, my dad's, my granddad worked on the train. So he went from being, you know, a, a, a train, a, a plate layer's son to becoming, you know, one of the richest people in the country. He became extraordinarily rich, extraordinarily quickly. And um, in, those, in the late 60s, they had... I think it was like 98% income tax or whatever it was. it was. And because he suddenly earned all this money, he found he was going to have to give, you know, most of it back. And so he actually became a tax exile. They went to Cannes, to the south of France. Oh. And then while he was in Cannes, um, I know all this because I've been told to be a million times, but I wasn't actually there. And then I was actually conceived in Cannes, and that's why they gave me the name Dominic, because they wanted to give me a sort of Frenchy name, but they, I think they wanted to call me like Jean-Paul or something like that. <laughs> Jean-Paul Frisbee would have sounded a bit weird. So anyway, I, I landed up with Dominic, and then it was made into a film which was very successful. And then, unfortunately, um, my parents got involved in a very acrimonious divorce uh, in the 70s, and that extraordinary amount of money that my dad earned by one way or another, whether it was to lawyers, some of it to my mum, but not, by no means, I don't think even half to her, and it was, most of it went to lawyers and to the tax man, he lost all his money again. So the, the big life lesson there is do not get divorced. Right, absolutely. And, and often divorce is inevitable because you and your partner don't get on anymore. And so the even bigger life lesson is to make sure you choose your partner very carefully. Indeed. And, and it very rarely gets mentioned in an investment context. No. That is absolutely true. It's one of the biggest destroyers of wealth ever. Yeah. And, and as, as Mr. Bezos might be about to find out in Amazon as well. Well, yeah. And um, um, another close family member who was married for 32 years uh, to her husband, and her husband was very old, about to die, um, and she was worth kind of two-thirds of the marriage, recently got divorced. And because of the divorce laws in the country, the money was split 50-50, even though she's got a life expectancy of, you know, three, four times as long as he does. But the, the, his daughters agitated for this divorce because they wanted to take half her money in his inheritance, if that makes sense. So the 50-50 law was designed to to protect against that, but in fact it's been exploited, it gets badly exploited, as most laws do. Okay, so, so, so you grew up with that kind of scenario. What, what were your kind of life or career plans as you reached adulthood? Uh, I never had any really. I was, always had this vague idea that I would be a writer. I can remember people, like my mum having dinner parties when I was about 15 and all these incredibly old people asking me what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do, and I never really had any idea. Mm. And um, I mean, I've always had this vague idea that I'd like to be very successful, but I've never quite known how and, you know, comfortably off. Um, but anyway, I went to university and I did Italian and drama at university because my mum was Italian, my dad was a dramatist, so it seemed like a sort of logical thing to do. And um, then I was sort of clearer that I wanted to be a writer. 
And, but all the best writers, had, from Shakespeare to Dickens, all these great writers, they'd all started out as actors. So I had this idea that if I want to be a writer, I needed to be an actor first. And so that's when I went to drama school. And then when I was at drama school, I found that I was the best at radio in the year. <laughs> I don't know why, but I was the best at radio. And I made a tape, and this, this voiceover artist like, got hold of the tape within, before I'd even left drama school and signed me, this, sorry, this voiceover agency, mm. and had my first job within a week of me leaving drama school. And it was a one-year contract presenting ATP Tennis on Channel 4 with Andrew Castle, who's gone on to become a um, presenter on uh, ITV and at various other places. Um, but just, just doing the, the voice for it. And, you know, suddenly I was a voiceover artist, and, and I've always done that, but, you know, voiceover artists in the full-time work, so there's always been plenty of time to write as well. Okay, but I think you also, I think you did a, a, a sitcom with Davina McCall, you played a gay salsa teacher in Murder in Suburbia, you know, you had a, a, a million views of your debt bomb video on YouTube, so I guess, obviously, from there, natural progression into financial journalism. Well, obviously, what happened is... is is I earned a bit of money, I, you know, I carried on acting, but what I hated about acting is that um, the f once the last job finishes, your f the entire future is completely dark. Mm. You never, you just got no idea, and, and, and the insecurity of it drove me insane. Whereas voiceovers, which is even more insecure, because I don't even know what tomorrow's jobs are until tea time today, but for some reason, because there was a constant flow of work, I was always more comfortable with it. And you're treated very well doing voiceovers, you're treated like royalty. And even if you're, you don't get treated like a big star, you, you, you earn good money. And um, anyway, so by the, by the um, mid noughties, I'd earned a bit of money and I wanted to invest it. And I started reading um, various things online and I became convinced that gold was, was the place to be, and it was in, the, in that decade. And but then gold is a very political metal because it used to be money and raised all these political issues which I found incredibly interesting. And there were all these people that I wanted to meet and talk to. And I thought, how do I get to meet them? If I want to just hire them for an hour of their advice, it's going to cost me two, three hundred quid, five hundred quid every time. I'm not going to do that. And at the same time, the fund managers I spoke to about investing my money, they always wanted their little clips. And I just thought, I don't trust that. So I started a podcast as a means to interview these guys and meet them. And of course, everyone's busy pushing their own brands. So they're all quite happy to come and talk on the podcast. And I discovered that podcasting is the best way to meet people. Really? And in the sort of intensified uh, environment of, a, of an interview, yeah. you kind of get through a lot more, you build up a relationship much more quickly because you have to get to the point more quickly. Mm -hmm. So I just met loads of people. One of the people I met was Marion Somerset Webb, who was the editor of Money Week. And she said, oh, we need people like you to come and write a column for us. And I was like, well, I don't really think, you know, I'm a comedian. The other thing is I started, began a career as a comedian on the side. I don't really think I should do this. And Marion said, no, 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 we need people who can talk about finance in a language that people understand. And so I wrote the column, and the podcast proved very popular because I was asking the questions that everyday people have on their minds. And the column proved very popular, and that's how I ended up writing about finance. Okay, so, so obviously you, you, you write about it, but also you start investing in it. And, and yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, clearly at that time, you're not just investing in the metal, I think you're also looking at the miners who produce the metal. Yeah. So that was a, a, an interesting kind of somewhat higher risk scenario, perhaps. Well, I, I don't think I quite understood the risks that I was taking, but I invested a lot in gold and silver, physical gold and silver. Um, and in fact, I sold, I had various properties which I sold to invest in gold and silver. And for a while, that proved a brilliant investment. Um, and then what I didn't see coming out of the financial crisis was the, the slashing of rates and everything that happened, quantitative easing, and the big boom in property that came between about 2010 and 2015. And I missed on that, missed out on that. Never quite forgiven myself. But, but what I didn't understand about mining is we were trained that if you, that, that we were, I was led to believe rather, that if you in, um, invested in a mining company, it, was, it gave you optionality on gold and silver. It was like buying an option mm. on gold and silver. What I didn't risk, didn't understand, was the actual risk of mining itself. How much can go wrong? Whether it's running a functioning mine uh, or exploring for, for, for metal itself. And you read that, you know, this guy's drilled this and he's found this much rock in the ground. You think, yeah, great. But you don't realise the multitude of problems that that guy's ever going to have getting it out of the ground. You know, I was investing in mining companies and did quite well out of it for quite a long time. 
but without actually realising what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. and that I would discover later. Ah, OK. So, so, so you were in the uh, mining and gold itself at that point. Um, what, what kind of, where did you take it from there in terms of broadening out and diversifying your investment portfolio? Well, I haven't diversified anything like as much as I should do. And I feel that diversification is a means of protecting wealth. Yeah. Whereas if you actually want to make money, you need to concentrate on one particular area. Yeah. But that, the problem with that is if you concentrate on the wrong area, you also lose a lot of money. Right. But if you diversify, say you do the Mark Farber thing where you're 25% in precious metals, 25% in bonds, 25% in real estate, and 25% in equities. You know, there's your diversified portfolio in very simple terms. And, you know, the bond market could be doing very well for a bit and the real estate market could be suffering. Well, you're, in terms of your overall portfolio, you're fine because you're diversifying. But, but in terms of, like, building, if you want to make a fortune... You've got to get in, find a bull market, get in early, mm. and then get out near the top. Right, Sounds yes. easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're telling like... me that you didn't quite manage to succeed in the, uh, in the gold sector with that timing. I, I um, made, at one point, you made so much money in mining mm. because you could literally buy stocks and they'd go up five times. And I had one stock that went from $1 to $30. Can you imagine? Wow. But now... Yeah it's trading at $4. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So you did all the way up and all the way down. Mm. And I'd never, I only ever had any ever experienced a bull market. I'd never experienced a bear market. And so I didn't see the signs early enough and I didn't get out mm. early enough. And now, like when people talk to me about mining and gold and bull markets and things like that, you know, I think I, I, I feel having lived through the mining bear market, you know, I'm the, the, the most wise as to the nature of bear markets. They're vicious, horrible things. And I got into cryptocurrencies very early and I did very well out of that. But now Bitcoin is in a massive bear market and all these guys are losing fortunes. Mm. And I'm kind of sitting there going, it's a bear market. It can be a lot more horrible than you think. And, you know, I'm not liked for saying it, mm. but I've seen it in mining. I know what can happen. OK, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So please join us again after the break. <laughs> Welcome back. Before the break, we learned about Dominic's mixed experiences in the gold market. And then we just started touching on the subject of cryptocurrency. So, so Dominic, obviously you've been through this kind of up and down twice now with gold and then cryptos. Where do you see the cryptocurrency market going from here? The answer to that question, Graham, is there are two ways it can go. And that depends on how, it depends on your view of how unique and special the technology behind Bitcoin is. Now, if Bitcoin really is going to be the default money system of the internet, it will have extraordinary value. If blockchain technology is really going to transform, you know, everything from financial markets to, to the way we vote to the legal system, as many of his advocates say it will, then it will have extraordinary value. But if it's just another kind of flash in the pan technology, then we're going to be in this mired in this bear market for quite a long time. Mm. But even something like the internet, which um, you know really did change the world, the Nasdaq, which is the sort of the index of the internet, if you like, mm. only regained its dot com highs three or four years ago. Yeah. So it can take that long, you know, fifteen years or something. But that said, you know, if you bought Amazon. Apple, Google, Microsoft, any of these kind of companies in 2002, 2003, you made your money many times over. Yeah. Um, if you look at 3D stocks, there was a huge bubble in 3D stocks in around about 2014. And, you know, you could buy, there's one company, 3D Systems, you could have bought it for a dollar in 2009 and sold it for $95 in uh, 2014. And, you know, 3D technology, it's going to change the world. Um, 3D printing, we're all going to have just download the software onto our printer and print up whatever we want. You can build a house with a 3D printer in China of $10,000. Incredible possibilities. Everyone really excited. And then you think, yeah, but 
you know, Amazon are already delivering products within six hours. Mm -hmm. Do I even need a 3D? Where am I going to put a 3D printer? And what about the problems I have with my ordinary, you know, Hewlett Packard printer? And it's always jamming and it doesn't the, connect to the internet properly or doesn't connect. You know, think of the problems you have with your printer and how, and that's just paper. How, what kind of problems are you going to have with the 3D printer? So everyone was that suddenly was like, oh, actually, maybe 3D printing isn't all that. And so that $95 stock went all the way back to $6 and, um, in 2005. And here we are in 2019, and it's like $9. So, 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 so the bear market went on four or five years. Yeah. So the question with Bitcoin is, if it really is special, we'll have a big washout. Was 2017... Bitcoin's dot-com moment, mm. or is Bitcoin's dot-com moment still to come? Yeah. And 2017 was the internet in 1995. That's the big question that's still out there. So, so would you be putting new money into cryptocurrencies today? Uh, well, I am putting new money into it. I've just uh, become a director of a, uh, of a Canadian company, which has been set up specifically to invest in privacy technologies, yeah. uh, including privacy coins. And, um, you know, I've put a lot of my own money into it. Mm. And I think that privacy uh, is going to be the narrative which drives the next big bull market in, market in technology. Mm, no, I buy if you think that. how important yeah. privacy yeah. is and how we've given it away without realising it. Exactly. And I just suddenly think people are going to start and all the manipulation that goes on with, you know, with yeah. Facebook data and elections yeah. Yeah. and all that, yeah. there's going to be maybe even government regulations demanding that you certain privacy things and that yeah. cost is going to end up being passed on to the um, consumer one way or the other. Mm. There's going to be privacy is going to change. The value of privacy is... No, absolutely. And I think you, know, you mentioned the government there. And I know in, in your, your book, uh, Life After the State, you know, you, you talk about how you think society should be run. And um, obviously, we're going through all kinds of stuff at the moment with Brexit, etc. Um, what, what do you think are the fundamentals that need to change in the way we run our country? And, and what are the kind of lessons that you'd want to see learned coming out of life after this day? Well, I've, I've um, just written, uh, I've just finished the first draft of my next book, which is called Daylight Robbery, The Past, Present and Future of Taxation. And in that, I've written a big chapter on Hong Kong the incredible success story that is Hong Kong, mm. that, you know, you, get, you have no idea how penniless that country was in 1945. It's, and it's now, per capita, its GDP is three times uh, what the average person in the UK's mm. uh, GDP per capita. It's extraordinarily rich. And it was so successful, so quickly, that Singapore copied it, South Korea copied it, Japan copied it, even China copied it. And there's like statements where like, people thought when Hong Kong was put back in China in 1998 that that would be the end of Hong Kong. No, it was the end of China. That's how powerful the Hong Kong model is. And it was built on low taxes and simple taxes. Even today, uh, tax lawyers agree that Hong Kong has the best tax code in the world. It is 1.5% the length of the British tax code, one and a half percent. And um, uh, tax revenue, they never spent before they earned, right. never any debt. Um, GDP was always, uh, tax, uh, tax revenue was always around about 15% of GDP. About 40% of tax revenue came from land taxes yeah. rather than income taxes. Income taxes only affected the highest earners, never more than 15%. Mm -hmm. Low rates of corporation tax, attract investment, and it was all, almost all of it, was down to this one man called Cooperthwaite, mm. uh, a Scottish uh, adherent of Adam Smith, who was Hong Kong's financial secretary, John James Cooperthwaite. And he, he was deputy financial secretary and, and financial secretary. And you listen to his speeches in the Hong Kong Assembly, and they're so funny, and they're so kind of Thatcher-esque, and just... But he, he refused to compile d GDP data because it will only be used against me. And eventually he became under all this pressure to compile GDP data. Um, and uh, so he hired this academic to compile the data. And for seven years, this poor man kept giving him revisions of the data. And people thought, no, it's flawed because of this reason, it's flawed because of that reason. And after seven years, the, the academic eventually resigned. And Cooper Thay went back to the Hong Kong Assembly. It's not working. The GDP data is not working. It, and, and it's because the whole idea is flawed. And, but he'd set this guy, up, poor man, up to be a full guy. But, you know, he did all these things. And it was quite authoritarian. Hong Kong was, wasn't a democracy. It was a mm. British colony. Mm. And 
obviously China's also authoritarian. Singapore. But they're, <laughs> yeah, they're all authoritarian co countries, but in terms of what their economies have achieved and in the space of time they've achieved it, it's amazing. And Hong Kong, so if I'm Prime Minister, yeah. the first thing I do is simplify the tax system and I model a new tax system on Hong Kong. And, um, and, and you know, I really think taxation is the zero patient. It's like you determine the destiny of a country by the way you tax it. And our tax system is overly complicated, it gets manipulated, it gets abused, people cheat it, um, it favours, you know, there's loads of subsidies that favour some people against other people. There's so much, uh, 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 um, in it's, it's inequitous. Um, and so my, my thing would be reform tax and then let everything else take care of itself. So, so that brings me on to the other big question hanging in the air at the moment. Uh, I'm guessing with that sort of a manifesto, you're probably not going to get offered a job by Jeremy Corbyn if he comes into power. So you know, what might happen to us if we have a Corbyn McDonald government? We will tax ourselves into oblivion, I fear. Um, McDonald's actually in favour of land taxes and I support him on that. Um, but he's in favour of land taxes in addition to other taxes. I would have land taxes to replace other taxes. Um, but I don't think you need worry about a Corbyn government, Graham. Um, I don't think the British people will vote for it. I think there's far too much apathy about this. I think what they'll do is they'll vote for change in a bit, a bit like America did with Trump. It doesn't necessarily matter who the person is or what they say their policies are. They're just going to want something different from the status quo. Jeremy Corbyn does not have the charisma of Donald Trump. <laughs> no, that's Donald true. Trump, would, Jeremy Corbyn just, what does Jeremy Corbyn think about Brexit? He never says. Mm, mm. And, you know, people need leadership. Donald Trump would not only be holding court about Brexit, even if he totally contradicted himself one week to the next, he'd be holding court about it, he'd be saying this, he'd be slagging off the EU, he'd be making ridiculous demands on the EU, then he'd be going, look, they can't meet my demands. And, and he would do a deal, some kind of deal. And you can, you can say what you like about Trump, but... He does deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he imagine. sorted out the EU, and within an hour, he sorted it, came to an agreement with Juncker. So I don't think the comparison between Jeremy Corbyn and Donald Trump is valid, but I will accept your point that um, Britain, we're in an era of strongman leaders, mm. where countries want strongman leaders, and Britain craves some kind of strongman leader. But I don't think Jeremy Corbyn is a strongman leader. Yeah, you're probably right. But uh, thinking about the sort of longer term perspective, you know, you've got your own uh, children growing up now. What, what are you going to teach them about money and investing that perhaps was, was lacking in your foot, uh, financial education? The power of compounding is like no other power on earth. It is, as Einstein said, the eighth wonder of the world. Mm. And, um, you know, I've already got my kids' junior ices and I'm trying to get them to monitor it and, and uh, you know, keep adding to it. And my son, it, rather than give them pocket money straight into their current account, I put half the pocket money into their uh, savings account and half into their current account. And then when there's a big pile in the savings account, I move it into the junior ISA so that there's a constant kind of compounding effect. Yeah. But unfortunately, the wisdom of the power of compounding uh, is not understood by the young, and then if only it was. Okay, well, you can perhaps tell them a bit about it as they grow up, so that, you know, they'll, they'll have a little nest egg already put away. Dominic Crisby, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, join us again next week on Money and Me, where we'll learn some more financial life story secrets from some of our most prominent people. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.